Eliza, thank you for turning on the recording, Eliza. Uh, we'll call this uh, meeting of the Lower Connecticut River Valley Regional Planning Committee to order. It is Monday, February 26, 2024 at 7 p.m. And we are meeting this evening uh, via Zoom teleconference. Uh, Eliza, I'll ask that you uh, please call the roll. Sure. Um, Chester Carly Daly is here. Hello. Hi. Hey there. Um, from Clinton, I see Alan Kravitz. Um, from Cromwell, Anthony LaCava is here. Hello. Um, Tony, are you here from Deep River? I do not see you. Um, from Durham, Frank D. Felice. East Haddam, Debbie Langdon. East Hampton, Michael Kowalczyk. Essex, Carrie Duquez, um, Killingworth, Alec Martin, and Stephanie Warren. I don't see Mary from Lyme. Um, and from Middletown, Nathaniel Spencer. Um, welcome, Nathaniel. Nathaniel is the new um, alternate from Middletown. Hello, welcome, Nathaniel. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad you could make it. Thank from you, guys. Old, from Old Lyme, I see Harold Thompson. Um, Old Saybrook, Doug McCracken. Um, I don't know if Michael's here as well. No. And uh, Portland, Chantal Foster, Westbrook, Bill Neal. And right. Rumble is coming in from Haddam over here. Great. All right. And for seating of alternates? Um, we are going to see Anthony LaCava in Cromwell, Debbie Langdon in East Haddam, and Nathaniel Spencer in Middletown. Wonderful. Of course, everybody's always welcome to participate in discussion. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for that, Eliza, and thank you, everyone, for attending tonight's meeting. Uh, with that uh, seating of alternates, uh, are there any uh, amendments to the agenda? Hearing none, I need a motion to approve. Approved motion. Thank second. you, Rel. And I heard a second. Who was that? Alan. Alan, thank you very much, Alan. All right. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Right. Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? I declare the motion passed. That brings us to uh, item number five, which is public comment. Any members of the public who wish to speak on any matter, uh, this is your opportunity to do so. And we uh, we hope you'll take advantage of that. Any members of the public? All right, hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, we have uh, minutes of the past meeting. These were in your package. Uh, and uh, so if you need a minute to look through them, that's we can certainly do that. Uh, if you've already looked through them and you're all comfortable, you can certainly uh, make a motion. Motion to approve the minutes. And that was made by Doug. Doug. Thank you, Doug. Second. And is there a second? Second. Second, second by Bill Neal. All right. Any discussion? Hearing none all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining. I declare the motion passed. All right, uh, for item number seven, referrals. I'm not sure if we have any referrals, Sam. Do we We have anything on the table? Um, Megan? Eliza, correct me if I'm wrong. Sam. Um, Megan, I don't think we have anything significant. Uh, Megan? Um, no, there have been a number of referrals that have come in um, with minor changes to things. They've all been updated on the spreadsheet, but nothing has been brought to us to come to the meetings. All right, very well. With that, we'll move on to number eight, what is it, which is uh, kind of the highlight of tonight's meeting, and that is a discussion on the legislative proposals. As you all know, the, the legislature is in session, and it is a short session, but there's uh, quite a few bills that uh, certainly will impact our towns, whether it be land use, inland wetlands, uh, 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 combined use of things like building inspectors and so forth. And so there's some good. And like every other year, there's some good and there's some bad. So, Sam, uh, do you want to take this, or do you do you have someone that you'd like to take oh, it? I'll 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 take it over, um, and we can have a discussion, and I can go over um, our bill tracking um, spreadsheet. Uh, but okay. uh, you know, it, the, this is the short session. It's supposed to be a session 
um, that for budget modifications for the biannual budget. It's really not supposed to be a, a session for big proposals. Of course, legislators still do it anyway. Um, uh, unlike the long session, um, bills can only be proposed by the by the committee chairs. So, um, so there are a lot fewer bills, which is good because there's less time. Um, but there's still uh, a wide variety of ideas and 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 bills um, out there. And um, and unlike last month, when uh, when I didn't at first, I didn't have much much report because it, the session had yet yet to start, so we hadn't seen anything yet. We only heard rumors. We now actually have seen bills uh, proposed. Um, and uh, I was um, uh, I was ill all last week. I had a terrible cold with a fever. So I think it was my first cold in about four years. Um, and so the benefits of mask wearing and COVID was I didn't have a cold. So I came back. So I fell a little behind, but I've, I've caught up and I've been starting to write testimony. And I'm going to share my screen and, and sort of, uh, first of all, I'm going to show you um, uh, a, uh, a, bill uh, a spreadsheet that uh, we've created uh, for our purposes of tracking bills, and we're able to share that with uh, with all of you. Um, uh, I've asked Kevin to create a um, a uh, a view only link for you, so uh, so you can view it. You can see it as we update it, um, but um, but you won't be able to change the information on the spreadsheet just because we 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 really want to use this as a tool for tracking bills. And if and if everyone had the ability to you know, add uh, change the information on here. It could get, it could go it could go badly quickly. So, um, but if you have any uh, corrections or something you want to get get to me or you want you want that something added to this, please uh, you can email email me or Eliza. We can add to it. So, um, so you can publish this. Um, well, we 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 pub we have a link which um, I'll oh. ask I'll ask Kevin to put in the chat and we can email to you so you can see this list. It's okay. it's really not it's not really meant for public consumption, um, but uh, but there's nothing in here that's not public. These are all bills that we're looking we're tracking, right. and and uh, and and uh, so so what you'll see on this spreadsheet, if you see my screen, you'll see the first column is the bill number, and that is a blue hyperlink. So if you click on that, it will take you to the bill the bills page. Um, so it which will show the status of the bill, it will show you any votes. And it will show you the. It'll have a link to the text of the bill, the most recent text. Um, uh, we also have the title, uh, what committee has it, the public hearing date, you know, if it passes, and then some notes. Um, I'm also going to add a column here with a link to Rivercog testimony for for the ones what we submitted testimony. I only started submitting testimony um, well on Sunday uh, because I was out. I was out all week last week. Um, Due to my cold, unfortunately, so catching up. Uh, but uh, or and we've already submitted on three bills, um, and and then some other staff uh, may be working on some as well. Um, and so I'll just go through some of the things that we have highlighted here, and I'll talk in more detail about some the, some of the bills I think are interesting. Um, I think the the first one, which I had a hearing last week, an act concerning the standardized evaluation of affordable rental housing. I didn't get a chance to write in support of this, but I think it made a lot of sense. Um, commercial property is usually valued based on the rent that it generates. And so the idea here is that if you are renting, um, if you have a rental apartments and they're, they are affordable um, at, a, at renting at affordable rents, that the value of that property would be uh, calculated based on the, the income generated by those affordable rents as opposed to the highest best use and the highest rents that you could potentially. So it, it makes sense. Um, that's, uh, and I think that uh, would be, uh, I, I think that's, I think that's a, it's a good concept to give a, give a tax break to landlords who are, um, who are renting at, at affordable rents. Um, uh, Debbie, I see that you have your hand raised. Yeah. Um, it's, I think it's a double-edged sword. I'm also on the, um, uh, assessment appeal board. So I'm, I'm, I appreciate that maybe there's an incentive for developers as a tax abatement, but I just feel I just don't want it always to be in the developer's favor. I think the town should be getting mandates or uh, some incentives. I just I see a trend that all the incentives are 
for the developers. And this is a perfect example. That's all. Well, the other thing that I think that could be beneficial here is I've always seen this as a potential way of first um, being able to um, count naturally hey. affordable housing. So so you have you have small landlords who are renting at affordable rents. It may not be deed restricted, but it's an affordable rent. Well, in order to get, uh, you know, th this is not necessarily in the bill, but in order to get um, this valuation, you have to, you uh, you know, you have to prove that you're renting it for that rent, which means the the tenant has a lease, um, which gives them protection. And and I, I could see value in the long term of being able to have a town having a number of how many affordable units, that, how many affordable rental units they have, whether they're deed restricted or not, because I, I think there's a lot more, there's a lot of affordable housing out there that's not counted because it's it's not deed restricted. So there there could be some value to the town here uh, to be able to understand what is the real affordable housing market looking like, not just the affordable housing units that are deed restricted. Um, but- yeah, my, my, my only second point would be, again, I'm on assessment appeal and the town gets really nervous when we knock a million dollars off the, the grand list. And oh. I assume that this is also going to be knocking um, a lot of money, tax dollars, potential income for the towns um, who are struggling like our towns. I mean, we can barely afford to fund our schools. Yeah. So that's perfectly legitimate because, the, yeah, this this the basis here is that you uh, is that the only reason a landlord would do this is to save money on taxes, which comes right. up. And you're absolutely right. So it hurts our grand list. Yeah. Yep. So again, you know, incentivize the towns, not always the developers, because the towns, you know, uh, it's a balancing. Anyway, act. I'll I'll let you continue. But the big negative for the towns that don't have a lot of businesses like East Haddam and rely on property taxes for ninety five percent of our our grand list. Yeah, and, and we run into the same issue when it comes to there's a few bills about motor vehicle taxes, and you know, no no one likes paying motor vehicle taxes. Uh, motor vehicle taxes. Um, there, there, ha there was a cap that was uh, in, uh, uh, initiated two years ago in a statute. No, no, no one likes them. But at the same time, it comes off the grand list and it shifts that tax burden from the motor vehicle owners to the property owners. So, you know, th these are all uh, tax policy. Uh, these policies have tax implications, and uh, so it's uh, so th there's always going to be that concern on the town side. Uh, that's legitimate. So. So thank you, Debbie. Um, mm -hmm. The next, um, this is something which uh, which actually I submitted um, uh, testimony on personally um, and at con uh, concerning solar installations and condominiums and cooperatives. Uh, uh, I, I'm on a con I'm on my condo board, and so I submitted testimony in 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 favor of making it easier for condominiums to to take advantage of solar. Um, the next is Atkinson. Can I ask a question on that, Sam? Are you in favor of raising the cap? I understand there's a two, a two hundred uh, megawatt or whatever. No, it's not megawatt, whatever cap that they want to raise. So I don't know enough about the solar energy market to be able to competently weigh in as as to whether the cap should be raised or not. I just know that right now. Um, uh, solar is really only open to those who a uh, single family own a uh, single family residence residences who own the roof, and and there should be there should be legal ways for uh, multifamily uh, residents multifamily to be able to take take advantage of solar. Um, the issue of generating capacity and the cap is something which I haven't researched, so I don't I don't have a educated opinion on. Well, I just had the impression that there is already a way for these for these uh, cooperative things to take place, but it it's got so many constraints in it that nobody's you know you need somebody to be able to make money on it. <laughs> right, and I, one of the big issues when it comes to let's say um, uh, a condominium is that in an attached co condominium, no one no one owns the roof. The condo association owns the roof. And so you you you're putting it's really a community solar project for a condominium, mm -hmm. and uh, and it it becomes a billing issue as opposed to anything else because you you need to be able to apportion the generation credits to the individual meters uh, in the condominium, and 
Um, and that is, there's no, there's nothing in the statute that sort of makes the electric company do that. You could, uh, in cooperatives or um, or in condominiums, the common meter, so the meter for common spaces, and you know that can be on solar because there's just one. There's only one meter. Uh, so I think that's. Uh, but it's. But it. But I think condo law, as uh, Senator Neiman has explained to me, is very complicated, and, and a lot of legislators are not willing to wade in there because of because of other issues, I guess, with condo law. But I think it's more of an issue of. Uh, of access. Um, the next one is act concerning funding for development affordable housing. Um, uh, it's my understanding that this bill is, um, yes, uh, it's uh, it's bonding for uh, for affordable housing. Uh, I think it's a level of two hundred million dollars. Um, um, that's what that act is about. Um, Sam, my my only question. Um... Isn't there a question, uh, an issue about equitable funding for affordable housing? It seems um, that the cities or the larger, you know, areas with the infrastructure take most of the money off the table, even though they have mandates for the rural areas. They don't get that money just doesn't seem to go past the big towns and cities. Yeah, I, I, do, I don't know um, about the distribution and particularly for this for that bill or past bills, I do know that you are right. Uh, majority of the money does go, uh, go to the larger population centers. Um, but I, I don't I don't know enough to be able to comment about that distribution. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but it but it is a concern. Like rural areas need affordable housing too. and and if there if there are going to be state subsidies for affordable housing, it there should be a distribution across the state. yeah, I, I, I... Pigeon this whole pigeonhole this in um, the unfunded mandate categories yeah. <laughs> again. <laughs> well, well, here's another one. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Bill fifty one sixty seven, an Act concerning property tax abatement for certain first time home buyers. Uh, it's a property tax abatement, so it's coming at the cost of the grand list. Um, I don't, I don't have a problem with helping first time uh, home buyers buy homes, especially given that interest rates are so much higher today, but. Uh, but as Debbie has made the point, uh, tax abatements like this uh, um, do come at the cost of the other taxpayers um, and the and the grand list. So it's it's once again a policy debate, um, and this is uh, to authorize municipalities to abate five hundred dollars per assessment year of property taxes uh, for certain first time home buyers who finance through CHAFA. I think one of the comments here is that CHFA, who provides um, provides uh, subsidized mortgages. Um, uh, there, the, 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 if you have a CHAFA mortgage, your your unit is automatically considered affordable under the uh, 830G definition. Um, That's correct. Uh, but um, there's also if you get if you live in a rural area and you get a USDA mortgage, the USDA mortgages also count as affordable. So really, it should be for USDA mortgages too to be equitable. But but this once again comes at the cost of um, uh, the grand list. Um, yeah, I'd rather they figure out a different approach than property tax, like maybe through income tax or state tax. Let the state take a hit, you know? Oh, yeah. No, it could, it could be a tax credit um, on on that uh, that that file, uh, that income tax filers uh, state income. tax. Yeah. Yeah. yeah let this let the state take the hit. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's a good point. Um, so I, I have not read this bill, but this is another one. An act establishing a housing authority. Resident Quality of Life Improvements Grant Program and Equality Choice Voucher, uh, Voucher Task Force. I don't. I don't know. I have not read that bill, so I can't. Speak. I, I think. I think the issue on that is um, they're playing games that they can uh, extend their authority beyond their oh. municipality or their town. I think that's crazy. That's bill two hundred seven. I'll get to that. I wrote. I, I wrote. Uh, oh. I wrote okay. Um, the next is an act authorizing bonds for the state for the grant uh, grants and aid for, for certain nonprofit organizations for the development of affordable housing. Once again, it's um, it's state money for affordable housing. Um, I have I have not uh, commented on that yet. Um, next is an act authorizing bonds of the state to fund small multifamily hill. And so these are various state funding, and it's it's somewhat taking um, is a response to some of the criticism I've levied in the past. Is that is that 
the 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 argument that that the problems of of being able to produce affordable housing it's not just zoning it's also just the cost of of building housing it's it's expensive to build housing in Connecticut we have expensive land we have expensive labor material costs have got, are are so much more expensive so um so at, le at least here there 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 there's some bills to appropriate money to to buy down the cost um I I can't speak to the merits of these. I had not, I've not, uh, I haven't had a chance to read all of them, mm -hmm. but, but they are there. Um, and then I, I think that the, this is an inflation problem that they, they just don't want to admit to. It's all inflation related. Yeah. You um, know? the next, the bill I think is very interesting that I just submitted testimony on is Senate bill 207, an act inserting housing authority jurisdiction. I think it's a good concept, yeah. but it's, but it's not, it, 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 it it seems like uh, you need the you need the vampire rule. Um, the idea here is it gives the housing authorities in one municipality the ability to grow in other municipalities, um, mm -hmm. but it doesn't require mm -hmm. the invitation. Um, yeah, and, that's crazy. Uh, and so I think that if uh, that it actually makes a lot of sense if it, you have a housing authority that is well run um, and, and is doing good work. That maybe a town might decide to invite another municipality's housing authority to come in and uh, develop housing or run the housing in, a, in in another town, but it needs to be governed by some sort of invitation and agreement. Um, and uh, because without some sort of agreement inviting that housing authority in, you end up creating conflicts where you know your town may already have a housing authority and a new housing authority is coming in. It it it, it could cause it could cause problems. It seems like partnership between towns is a good way to go. Uh, anything that would potentially create conflict, I think, is not a great approach. Um, but uh, but I think the idea of, 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 of instead of every town having to create its own housing authority, um, that you have, uh, you can have a shared housing authority that multiple town that serves multiple towns, I think is, we, we do that with health districts. So I don't mm -hmm. think there's a problem there uh, with that. It's just it needs to be at the invitation of the municipality. Uh, it can't. It can't just be a rogue housing authority coming in. It's. Uh... <laughs> oh, and Sam, if I can just um, ask you if you've also heard the same thing. That speaking of rogue housing authorities, there's been some um, stories about conflict of interest and a little hanky panky going on. Um, so, um, they need to clean house before they think they can extend their authority. Yeah, the uh, housing authorities across the country have gotten a bad rap, and unfortunately, deservedly at times. Uh, and I think if there's a way of promoting well-run, competent uh, housing authorities, um, as opposed to um, uh, everyone having their own, I think there's benefit there. So, uh, so I, I wrote in support of this bill, except I opposed how opposed this one element, uh, one fundamental thing is that it, that housing that other municipalities house, housing authority needs to be invited in and there needs to be yeah. some sort of interlocal agreement that that outlines how that would uh, that would be done um all right, all right. so i'm going why don't you why don't you go through and just present the rest and we'll hold questions and, and until we'll... after we get to the end of this questions and comments go ahead yeah so um under transit there's a few bills regarding restoring funding to shrine east uh, those have not been heard yet and some of them are rather simple it just says restore funding uh, there's an act providing funding for showing show, uh, so there's two showing use funding. Uh, uh, there's also um, an act concerning free bus service for veterans uh, that has not come up yet for hearing. Uh, this is interesting. Um, Janice uh, has been working with our regional agricultural council uh, on, on testimony for this. There's an act to establish a tax credit for farmers who purchase equipment and technology for their farms. Um, and uh, and I think there's also or maybe uh, and then there's another one. I think that's it. Yeah. Um, no, it's not. Uh, yeah, I think it. I think it allows one. Uh, uh, once again, it's the issue that Debbie raised, but um, it it allows for a tax abatement of of a tractor of one uh, farm a piece of farm equipment up to a hundred thousand um, dollars. So I think it's uh, is it. But um, and uh, the, the the regional agricultural council is coming is working on testimony for that. Um, this is the next one's really interesting. An act concerning the establishment of riparian buffers and revision of certain inland wetlands provisions. Um, uh, it 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 would empower deep 
to create a uniform setbacks for inland wetlands. Uh, and uh, I think at 100 feet. Uh, right now, inland wetland review can be done up to 100 feet. Um, um, at the, the choice in municipality, this would make it uniform. I have heard about this bill. I have not read it yet, um, but the hearing is coming up on the uh, uh, on Wednesday. Um, next is an act establishing an extended producer responsibility program for consumer batteries. Um, uh, this would I, it would allow for the uh, uh, recycle uh, there'd be collection of money for recycling of batteries. Um, and next is a bill of uh, act concerning the purchase of certain lands of agricultural value. This is a uh, agricultural um, farmland preservation. Uh, an act concerning food waste as food scrap diversion from the solid waste stream and the redemption of out of state beverage containers. Um, this is that redemption of out-of-state beverage containers. I think it's going to be uh, is an interesting provision. Uh, once again, it's a it's a bill I need to uh, catch up on. It, there hasn't a hearing hasn't been scheduled. Uh, the food scraps section of this I think is going to be interesting because that's what Deep has been has been pushing as an approach for us dealing with waste disposal is to remove organics from the waste stream. So it'll be interesting to see what they're proposing here. But also, the the issue of redemption of out-of-state beverage containers. I think it was January 2nd, I was driving on Interstate 91 and I saw an old school bus completely full of bottles and cans. And I was like, oh, right, the deposit just went to 10 cents. Um, so someone was doing the, the the Kramer thing from Seinfeld where he or Kramer drove to uh, Michigan to the, to, get, to make to make an extra five cents on deposits. <laughs> this is of course, un unless our neighbors raise their deposits to 10 cents, it's an issue. Um, um, uh, Senate Bill 192, an act concerning dam safety. Um, I think this one's an interesting one um, in that 10 years ago, uh, deep uh, uh, not having the staff capacity to uh, inspect uh, privately owned dams across the state, uh, turned over responsibility to the private dam owners and gave them the responsibility for due inspections and also for them to create emergency plans in case of, uh, in case of rupture or it, or in case there was a major storm that could threaten uh, a breach of the dam. Uh, under this bill, that responsibility is good. Uh, Deep would take that responsibility back. Uh, I think that's probably a good step um, because um, individual property owners, uh, I don't think all have the wherewithal or can be relied upon to do this, but also um, our watersheds and, and streams and rivers um, are systems. And you could have individual property owners caring about their dams, but not necessarily the risk that could cause a, a, along a stream or along a, a long river um, in a major event. So um, I think Deep uh, could potentially, if they have the staff, do, do a better job. Um, and then let me quickly go through these uh, last bills under municipal planning. Um, this is an act authorizing the online publication of legal notices by municipalities. Many of you might be following the Fenwick case at the Supreme Court. Uh, this mm -hmm. is a case at the borough of Fenwick, where uh, Fenwick, uh, the, 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 the couple dozen residents of Fenwick, um, no one subscribes to the newspaper. So how do you properly advertise legal notices if there's no newspaper circulation? And Fenwick is, of course, the extreme case because it's so small. But with the decline of newspapers, this is a big issue. And um, I think in the past, you wouldn't be able to say this, but I think today, um, you, you may have more um, traffic on the town website than you do in the newspaper. Yeah. So, so this would this at the very least would save the town a lot of money, uh, although it would deprive the newspapers of an important revenue source. So, um, uh, so that's uh, that was that bill. Um, this is an interesting one. It was a governor's bill that I had a little bit of insight on um, pre before it was announced. There's an act of facilitating the expansion of shared municipal services. Uh, this came from the governor, and the proposal would be to allow the COGS to facilitate um, shared municipal officials, uh, and the legislation would allow towns to work together with uh, and create and sort of employ the, the shared a uh, shared official, let's say a building official, um, and uh, and any any impediments in statute or in charter uh, would be uh, uh, wouldn't have to uh, wouldn't have to be followed. Uh, this would uh, circumvent that. Um, it, one thing I think that would be is going to be kind of tricky is it creates a, a new sort of coalition bargaining um, 
scheme for uh, for the municipal uh, uh, bargaining units. And and I think that is going to is something similar to CBAC that you have on the state level, but you would have something on the local level. And that would I think that's that 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 will be interesting to figure out how that how you would do that. But um, it is in general something I've been advocating for. Um, if they uh, and and it's more as simple as this. If if you want shared services, you need to create a, a statutory pathway to get there, and you need to deal with the labor issues. So this is an approach that would that would sets forth a pathway to to do that. So um, so I, I'm. Uh, I'm optimistic about this, and once again, it's something that towns can take it take advantage of, but they're not forced to. So, uh, so that it passes that test in my book. Uh, next, NAC redu uh, reducing the mill rate cap for motor vehicles and reimbursing the spies for lost revenue. Um, it's uh, uh, self-explanatory. There's some there's some concerns about um, you know reimbursing towns. Um, it, that you you don't want to create and necessarily create an incentive for towns to to necessarily spend more money and and have higher mill rates, uh, so they so they so now get an entitlement from the state uh, for uh, for reimbursement. But at the same time, um, motor vehicle taxes are an important source of revenue. So I think there's um, um, I, I, there, there's been many attempts over the years to try to get rid of the motor vehicle tax. Um, I don't think it's really going anywhere, but if you but if you have the state stepping in to to make towns whole, um, it's it's really shifting that to the income tax or the sales tax because that's where the state's revenue is coming from. Um, next is Senate Bill Eleven, also a governor's bill. Very interesting. This is an act coordinating Connecticut resiliency planning and broadening municipal options for climate resilience. What this does is it does a, it does a few things. Um, I'll start with the, the planning of things. On the planning side, it requires you to incorporate the hazard mitigation uh, planning um, recommendations and 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 threats in your POCD, in the regional plan, and in in other documents. So so it's sort of kind of kind of creating a coordination between different planning documents, which I think is a good thing. Um, um, it also um, gives towns this ability to create these resiliency districts, um, which uh, which would be a special taxing district to raise money for for major infrastructure to serve that district. So let's say, for example, um, you have a portion of town that has flooding issues and you need uh, better flood infrastructure to be able to mitigate those floods. You can create a resiliency district that would uh, that would be able to borrow the money necessary. Um, to be able to do those improvements and then associate that tax with that specific district. Um, so it's it's a taxing mechanism for the municipality to be able to do um, uh, more uh, more neighborhood based improvements to deal with uh, with storm and climate resiliency and associate the costs with that portion of the town. Um, uh, that could it could be useful in some places. Uh, it might not be so useful in other places because uh, associating that burden with a specific neighborhood uh, limits uh, limits the people who uh, limits the ability to pay. Uh, those people have the limited ability to pay, and the, the base will be small. But it is an interesting tool that's uh, that's been proposed. All right, next, um, uh, next would be a, uh, a part of the occupancy tax on Airbnbs going to municipalities. Um, the next is an act eliminating the property tax on motor vehicles. Uh, the next one is an act concerning incentives for transit oriented development. Um, I've skimmed this. Um, I need to I need to read it so I can get uh, write some uh, uh, some testimony on this. But I think it's it's about incentives for uh, for municipalities to build around our transit station. So I think that's a I think that's a good thing. Um, uh, next uh, Senate bill. Uh, 227, an act concerning municipal web uh, internet sites. Um, you'll notice on a lot of government websites, they end with .gov for gov. That is a federal um, internet provider. Uh, and uh, and this, this would require all municipalities to move over to uh, .gov web addresses. Um, we've tried, we tried doing that at RiverCog, but giving up rivercog.org <laughs> would have been expensive, expensive uh, migration. So um, Kevin Armstrong, who who's on, uh, at the meeting, he he's helping me write that testimony because he knows the pros and cons. The pros are is that it can be more secure uh, from uh, from a security perspective, but it will come with costs. So um, so we'll 
we'll have some firsthand um, testimony on that. Um, next is an interesting bill, which I just wrote some testimony on, is an act concerning temporary shelter units for persons experiencing homelessness located on real property owned by religious organizations. So if you are a religious organization under this bill, you would be able to build, uh, uh, um, put up up to eight um, a unit, uh, a manufactured housing units, uh, no larger than 400 square feet, and 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 allow that on the property by right. Um, it requires a certain number uh, capacity for uh, men and women's bathrooms and showers uh, at the religious organization's property, um, and uh, and talks about lighting and fencing, and um, and it uh, and it does have some minimum set, minimal setbacks. It doesn't um, although it's called temporary shelter units. The only thing temporary about it is the tenancy of the residents. They can they can't stay there longer than uh, than twelve months. Uh, but these units can be there really permanently until until they're not habitable. Um, I, 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 there's a, I have a number of concerns here, um, mostly just re regarding just making ensuring that this is you know uh, there's a minimum lot size that this is that this is done. If you if you're going to be providing temporary shelter for home for people who are homeless who would otherwise live in a tent uh, in a in tent encampment, that that you know that there are you know that the place is kept is has meets basic sanitary standards and safety standards. The other issue is uh, I could see the church or uh, or synagogue or whoever is hosting this is taking on a lot of liability here, um, and uh, and. Uh, and I and I, I can understand that I know um, that there's been some interest here, but I I, I was like concerned about like what how 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 does how does this get run um, and and that and that's not even uh, taking into consideration any concerns of uh, the neighbors or neighborhoods. So um, I think it's an interesting idea. Um, I would I would prefer that you would ha that people have access to small manufactured. Uh, shelters as opposed to living in a tent outside in the winter um and this this could be uh this could be an, an approach um but i think the concept uh, needs to be thought out maybe just a little bit more um and then the last one is an act concerning extension of time for certain municipal commission board and agency decisions and training for inland wetlands agencies so this is the one that i, I mentioned i alluded to at the very beginning of the meeting um this uh, uh this bill um, starts off as a bill requiring training for inland wetlands commissioners. Um, so very similar to the training that planning and zoning commissioners have to, to have to get. Um, it directs deep to create a curriculum and create online training. Uh, and you know, it just it seemed pretty innocuous, I think, uh, and it requires the training once every I think four years, um, which I, I didn't necessarily uh, see a problem with. But then at the very end of the bill, it, uh, it changes the number of days that you can ask for an extension for an application. And this is not just for inland wetlands, but it's also for planning and zoning, ZBAs, and aquifer protection areas. And uh, and so currently, um, a commission can ask an applicant for an extension up to 65 days. Uh, this would reduce that down to 45 days. And um, my the test and the hearing was last week. I submitted testimony today, and I encourage all of you who sit on planning and zoning to do so. I submitted testimony that first faulted them for hiding a very important change uh, in uh, in this bill, and uh, and and that it really needs to, it should it should have been a standalone bill. But but also I pointed out a couple important items. First of all, at, with 65 days extension, that gives the commission two months, two months of regularly scheduled monthly meetings, or it could be a ZBA or in the, in the wetlands. Uh, at 45 days, it means you have to have a special meeting or you have to meet twice a month. Um, so, uh, and some of these some of these entities don't meet twice a month. So this is at the time when you're struggling to find commissioners. The other issue is I pointed out that that whoever's proposing this may think that it will facilitate faster land use regulatory process, but it won't necessarily because if um, uh, uh, it was pointed out to me that a lot of applications go in incomplete, uh, that applicants need to follow up and submit additional information for a commission to make a decision. Um, if, the, if the commission doesn't get the information it needs to, to say yes, it's going to say no. 
or it may ask the applicant to withdraw and resubmit. So, um, uh, so that that twenty day difference could make a, a difference as to whether the process is successful and someone gets their gets permission, or if someone has to start over again. So, um, it may not necessarily help the applicant. Um, so, um, so I so I submitted that testimony today just. Uh, and, um, and I encourage you to, to do so. Frank uh, pointed out to me uh, with a couple of citations uh, from the, the General Assembly website that that there was a change in the past as uh, they go from 45 days to 65 days to harmonize dates across all these different um, um, commissions. Well, uh, this undoes that. Uh, and uh, so um, so that, I think that's an important, uh, I think that was an important bill. And it was one of those sneaky things that on Sunday when I saw this, I was like, you know, this is important enough. It needs to be on its own. And hiding it at the end of innocuous bill is not the mm -hmm. right place. So, all right. So that's my summary of bills that we're aware of that uh, that, that we think might be interesting uh, to you as uh, RPC members. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Frank. Thank you very much for that presentation, Sam. A lot of a lot of stuff, I know for a short session, you don't normally see this many things that are impactful to uh, to the group here. Um, so uh, I was I was kind of surprised as as well as Sam and a lot of others that there were so many uh, things. So why don't we do this? Uh, first of all, uh, I'll, I'll let's go around and uh, if anyone has a question or a comment for Sam, or wants to make a statement about something here that we've discussed or refer back to one of those, Sam can bring it back up on the screen. Uh, why don't we start, uh, who would like, okay, Raul, you're up. I just want to make a, a suggestion to Sam, and maybe you've already implemented this. Yeah. It's very educational, and it, uh, many people are not aware of these things. So to the extent that you can, when you do draft these comments, uh, send them around not only to us and maybe maybe the, some of the members of the cog itself some of the selectmen or you know as you see fit but don't i would encourage you to to uh, not just keep it in your own desk drawer <laughs> no. So uh, some, no of the, some of the turnaround on this is like 24 hours so no uh, after you once but, you've but, sent but, it, oh yeah no i think i think that's a i think that's great um and what uh, what I plan to do on the spreadsheet, which we'll, you'll have a link to, is to have in one of the columns um, uh, a column with a link to my testimony. So you'll be able to see that. But you're right. Um, I think on regular batches uh, of uh, testimony should be sent out maybe on a weekly basis where yeah. we share we share with the CEOs and our legislative delegation. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And the other I thing, like that. too, uh, that's kind of related to that is the fact that, uh, especially in a short session all you'll see the turnarounds quick the committee will meet and they'll talk about these items th that they're considering mm -hmm. and then you'll see a bill in a public hearing and the bill may come out really may come out 24 hours before the public hearing so it's really tough i know sam and everyone up at river Cuck does a good job following that stuff i think even if the public hearing has happened it's still value and submit in public comments uh, because because the commission does read them. So, well, and furthermore, and once once they most of those don't end, end up in the trash can after the committee, but some actually make it to the session for voting. Yes, yes, and that's when you want to have people scream and yell if the thing is wrong. Right, right, and, oh. I'll, just, and I'll just add to that is that. Um, is that um, the you know what what the the legislators on the committee they go back to the testimony when they're debating amongst themselves whether the bill should be passed out of committee or not. So even if your testimony arrives late, um, uh, you know that that's fine. Is is and and um, and 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 if um, once we're done with this discussion, uh, I'm happy to go uh, walk people through the CGA website to show them how to see all these bills and how to submit testimony if they'd like. Yeah, okay. All right, others? Alan. Alan, go ahead. This seems like a uncoordinated, undirected series of old answers to very fundamental problems. It doesn't deal with the underlying issues. It, it's just totally fragmented. 
Welcome to Connecticut. Well, I, <laughs> that's right. not that's the shame of it. Yeah, that's not a good thing. No, it, it's just it, it's a list of of, of some, in some cases conflicting objectives. It, it, it doesn't deal with any of the major issues. I, no. Um, I, I think one thing that's interesting is like I, I, I I'll give you an example of the desegregate Connecticut proposal, which, um, which has not yet been it is uh, has not yet been introduced. Um, I don't, at least I don't think it has. Um, is that what's interesting is that last year there was a Connecticut Municipal Re Redevelopment Authority um, that was created by statute that that. The intent was that a municipality could partner with it to, to do development, uh, like let's say TOD development around their train station. Um, that the, uh, the having created that capacity to help towns looking to develop uh, and be able to do it in a coordinated with the state and to be able to leverage potentially uh, leverage state state funds, but also the coordination that you need on sort of state agencies. It, it is sort of like the ombudsman sort of approach that uh, that 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 the cities and towns might need to be successful of transit oriented development, and like it almost makes other approaches sort of just uh, you know the 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 uh, the 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 seg uh, sort of approach sort of like not not very helpful because it's just about zoning reform um, where you happen to have a bus. Um, and it really needs to be something more turnkey. And I, and so I think that's something which got passed last session, which hasn't gotten off its feet yet, but could be a very valuable tool for towns. Okay, right. Debbie Lankin, go ahead. Oh, I think Catherine had her hand up first. Uh, yeah, with, uh, Kathy, uh, Catherine is, uh, uh, had an opportunity to speak during public session. Uh, this is for the commission members. So it's, oh, it's sorry. your turn, Debbie. Okay. That's okay. Um, Sam, I, I was wondering if you knew um, who the sponsor was of that, uh, the temporary shelter on religious private property properties, uh, yeah. the bill 5174, and what the backstory and why they felt they needed to sponsor and uh, try to promote that. Oh, I don't know. I, I might be able to find the sponsor. I don't really know the backstory, but what I've heard is is there there has been a church uh i think that has been trying to do this um so i think it it, it may be it may be in response to, uh, to that specific uh, instance uh, but i don't actually know the backstory i do i do uh but for, from my understanding it's 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 meant to combat um uh homelessness and particularly uh, giving people who are living in uh homeless encampments uh an an option that's that's safer and 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 more durable, and more weatherproof. Right. Um, so I think it's I think it's well intentioned, um, uh, and and there's and there's definitely a need in places. The question is how do you how how does this get implemented, and, yeah. and who's going to do it? Yeah. What? Well, I, who's going to engage? Guess what it, in it? Yeah. Yeah. I guess I, I just want to know a little bit more of the backstory because you're we're hearing in the news where some of the um, illegal immigrants that were the, you know, whatever the, the word is for that, when they come over, they're putting them in airports and schools. And I didn't know if this was pushback and towns are saying, we don't want this in our, you know, airports and municipal buildings, um, kind of like a NIMBY. We don't want them in our town building. So put them on the churches. So are, do we expect illegal encampments of tent cities uh, after they kick them out of the airports and and the schools, <laughs> what, the, so that's why I want to know what the backstory is. On, what is there a density? You know that they're discussing. Yeah, like so one the tent. Density, yeah, the hundred tents. The maximum is eight units. So it's eight. Eight, eight tents. Eight, no, they're not tents. They're manufactured. Oh. Units, so they're tra more like a trailer. Trails. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so and, they can put eight on a church property of of what size? <laughs> no <laughs> minimum. There's no minimum parcel size. So Debbie, we, the, we the have... back story of this is that New Haven has a church that's already done this. Okay. They okay. went ahead and they put them on the property. And okay. then the building inspector had a fit. And they had to go <laughs> right. back and forth. And of course, it became a thing in the media. So 
The building inspector okay. finally capitulated, and the bill is in response to this. But, well, okay. I figured there had to be a story here because, yeah, okay. Yeah, and like and like some of the questions I put in my testimony on here is like, so it would make most sense to put these units on, uh, let's say, the par a parking lot um, where you have a firm surface. Well, what happens then to you know the parking requirements for that building? And you know, there's a lot of things right. that need to be thought out. And and furthermore, like uh, whereas we you know there are a lot there are many uh, homeless shelters and and soup kitchens that are run by religious organizations and they have the experience and the expertise to be able to um, to be able to serve this community. That's not that's not that's not to say that every religious organization has that ability or capability or or. It's not here. It's on. Um, so um, I'm just seeing that the historic New England church is built in the 17 and 1800s with pods sitting there for 12 months. And then after 12 months, we still can't move them. So I, I can see that being an issue um, yeah. in in any town. So yikes. Thanks for the backstory on that, Frank. You're yeah. welcome. Okay. Yeah. Others? Alan again. Yeah, Alan, go ahead. It seems ridiculous. Churches that depend on religious organizations, local religious organizations, having a hard time surviving. And we're going to place this, you know, count on this as a source of homeless housing. Oh, and uh, it, it it's not going to be cheap. Um, it it may be, it might be cheaper than building a new building with apartments. But it's not going to necessarily be cheap because you're still going to have to follow the building code. The electrical codes can require electrical service and boxes. Um, there's there's a um, if you don't meet if you don't have you may have restrooms in the church building, but you're not going to necessarily have showers. Um, um, one thing that's not mentioned in here is whether the units have kitchen facilities or not, or whether and if they don't have kitchen facilities. You know, there, there there needs to be some sort of kitchen facilities for the people to the store food and prepare food. Um, it, but I but I think the bigger the bigger question is is that um, can can this be a an approach in some places? I I, I think so. Um, it, it may, but it, it I can see a lot of is probably not the approach for most churches or most religious organizations. Uh, they may not have the wherewithal or the cash to be able to do it as Alan points out. So in the bill, Sam, uh, it does say accessory apartment means separate dwelling unit and a dwelling unit by definition, <laughs> building code has a bathroom, has a shower, has a kitchenette. Uh, it's got the, uh, the functions that you would require in order to, to live just like a small house, apartment, a condo, anything like that still has to have those things. No, but so no, they actually. Yeah, you're right. You're right about that. But in the language, uh, I'll bring it up. They create a new definition, and it's this, this temporary shelter unit, which doesn't say that. Here, I'll, I'll show, I'll show wow. My... So, yeah, so sure. temporary shelter unit means a non-permanent, commercially mm -hmm. prefabricated mm -hmm. accessory structure that is designed to be easily dismantled or removed but does not include tarps, tents, or other non-rigid materials or motor vehicles. So mm -hmm. it's basically a prefabricated unit. It's commercially available. Uh, and when they say non-permanent, I mean, that's the, the that's a wide open thing right there. What yeah. is non-permanent? You know, any building is non-permanent. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it could be towed away. Well, towed like away or taken down. Trailer. Yeah, well, it sounds like a construction trailer. Yeah, sounds like a construction trailer. Um, so that so the the bill does not address septic. Uh, it does not ad address well. Um, uh, I would assume, and like I asked that question, um, it, it it talks about how um, the sewer authority or the water company can't uh, assess separate connection fees um, for for this. But um, but but what if you're on sewer uh, on well or septic? Um, I, I assume the sanitary code would still rule. Uh, it has to. Mm -hmm. um, um, mm. And I wouldn't and, assume that. <laughs> well, the thing is, it should. Like, if you don't have capacity, yeah, you're too thick. Um, but it's. I, I asked that question in my testimony. Uh, but 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 I guess right here is the prefabricated accessory structure. 
And since they use the word accessory structure as opposed to accessory dwelling unit, it makes me question everything. Like I don't know what a uh, like an accessory structure could be a sh uh, could be a shed. Right. Um, so it doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily have a kitchen. Um, doesn't necessarily have uh, plumbing. That's yeah, scary. I think the biggest, alarming. Biggest, biggest thing about this is going to be that you know when you say religious organization, there's a lot of them. They're not just the churches. You know, even you know some somebody got their they're ordained, uh, you know, are they a religious organization? Yeah. It could make the case. Right. And, and and also it just seemed odd that they would uh, permit this for religious organizations, but let's say you have uh, nonprofits who are specialized in homeless ser uh, 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 services for people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, they're not allowed to do it, um, but, uh, but a church would. So, it, so I, thought yeah. that, I thought that was interesting that, um, that those nonprofits would be excluded. Um, and I asked that question in, in my testimony as well. Okay. And, and I guess my question is if, so the, the pods or, or trailers or whatever they are have to be removed in 12 months or, or no, just no, the no, no, resident no. of the unit. So, so that pod could be there for 10 years. Correct. There could be eight of them sitting in the front of the church a church that can't afford to paint itself or, uh, you know, redo the steeple like we have here in Moodis, but there could be eight little trucks sitting out front forever, as long as the people leave after 12 months. Correct. It sounds like a development <laughs> to me. Yeah. I, 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 I did ask the question in my testimony, would the residents have any sort of lease like what would what would the record keeping be? Because there's no uh, uh, to know when that twelve months started, and 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 then after twelve months, the person may not have anywhere to go. So what? Uh, and and then what would, about the? Uh, and then the last the last point was like I I assume that the really the organization would have to do a, an eviction process. Um, <laughs> But it, what's the point? Because then you have a new tenant coming in or a new homeless person or illegal immigrant or undocumented person coming in as soon as you evict them after 12 months. So it's it's basically permanent, according to the bill. Uh, there's no end date. And yeah. what, no, they, what about they the, can stay there? Yeah. So what about the, the residents? Because usually church has residential. So what if. I live in the house across from the church and I see these permanent eight pods with homeless illegals or whatever living there forever that your, your property value is just going to take a nosedive. So that's, it's avoiding public meeting in town. Um, this is a, a very no, by right use. So there'd be no special permit or special yeah. land review. Yeah. All <sighs> right. Scary. Alec, I see you have your hand up. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I know I know this is uh, the discussion is really interesting. The thing is, this actually starts, and this is where you kind of brought it in, Sam, um, to help people who are homeless, not and so that they're not living in some camp somewhere where there's thievery and whatever is going on over there. It's to try and help some people, and where we're going uh this thing this whole idea i mean it it's it's now i guess a fait accompli it's it's down in new haven as you said but um it could be permitted to death oh yeah we, uh, i mean we, uh, really i mean it really could the 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 orientation of helping people could just be well, we've got to consider, I mean, you've got to consider everything of a normal house being built. You could get down, you could go down that road and nix the whole idea anywhere of this kind of thing happening, which is, it's, it's kind of um, counterproductive to what they're actually about and trying to do. Now, I'm sure there'll be some certain instances where it's not a well-run situation and that's what you're after you're after a really well-run tight situation where whoever's in charge of it no matter what kind of church or religious entity it is 
is involved in really taking care that this is a well-run situation. That's what you're really after. Yeah, correct. And now you know that there are going to be kind of scandalous situations out there. But I don't think I don't think the 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 idea should be just totally thrown out by permitting the situation to death. And it's easily done. It's easily done. You got you mentioned parking, you mentioned you mentioned the uh, sewer, water, you know, everything. It it could be just well, you need to do this. It's dead. Okay, thank you. No, I, I think those were <laughs> excellent comments, Alec. And I, and I got to tell you something. The one of the issues, and the reason that we have these issues with with a, the need for affordable housing and all kinds of stuff like this is, is because it 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 does cost so much to build to the current standards. This is not built to the current standards. Right. If you're going to allow that. First of all, I don't know that you can really say it, it has to be a religious organization because that gets in the whole thing of what is and what isn't and how can you allow one group to do something and, and another group not to. But the, the really the answer is to say, shouldn't we maybe relax some of the standards that we have in place now? You know, there there's a there's there's people that will pay for that more efficient, better built, you know, place. But there's also this need for these other things like these these commercially available, you know, I'll call them pods, but they're basically a, mm -hmm. a pre-assembled modular structure. Um, and, and, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with living in one of those either. Right. It's just you've got this. You've got people pulling in both directions here, and really they need to be in alignment and say, OK, what do we really have to do to address this issue with the cost of housing? This is one attempt. And yeah, there's people out there that certainly are homeless and, and this is a solution to some of that, but it's it's a tough one. So, so. Yeah, yeah, but 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 this this isn't this specific situation isn't necessarily I mean it is addressing affordable housing in a way, but it's not addressing purely affordable housing. It's addressing homelessness. That's what and that's the word that has to be kept up right. front it's not yeah. affordable housing this is so that people aren't living alongside some god only knows what some toxic situation thieving going on uh people beating each other stealing you name it whatever yeah. so that it's it, it's it's a, a better run situation for these people temporarily yeah no i completely would agree you know, you're right yeah you're right that it serves it would serve homeless, and you're right. It's, right. It is somewhat different than affordable. Right. Alan, go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking that there is a lot of surplus property around, commercial property um, particularly, and why not provide for the possible conversion? S surplus schools, too. Yeah. Why not Absolutely. make them make mm -hmm. You know. and, and you know, Alan, that's a simple solution that for some reason the legislature hasn't been willing to adopt. Sam and I have talked about this at, at length. Mm. You know, there's there's a there I just heard yesterday that the value of commercial property is going to overall is going to drop like 17% next year because there's not a need for the amount of commercial property that's available. Mm. There will be vacancies, there will be buildings that are not in use. Couldn't they be, you know, put to use something? somehow make it work uh maybe the builder gets a reduction in taxes or or something but make and it make it attractive for it's them not to just do the housing conversion. The problem is it's not just a housing problem it's a social service problem mm -hmm. it's an education problem lack of jobs <laughs> lack of uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's talk about lack of jobs i mean and and right uh, you know, we're number one in electricity in, in in the country out of 50 states, most expensive electricity. Uh, there's no cap on property taxes. So there's so many aspects of what makes things affordable. Inflation is runaway. Uh, if so I may, so I, have a little, I have a little experience in that. And, I, you know, there are, there are programs out there now to convert schools, to convert office buildings to housing. Those are funded. They get you can get tax credits 
but they are also takes a takes a very long time. It takes literally five years to get those projects on on yeah. on the books. This is an attempt just to give some quick, immediate relief for some some people that you know that can live on a survive on a, on a religious campus, as it were. Uh, but it just it's just it's just solving a small need. Yep. The large need is always there, and we need more money from the federal government. We need more money from the state government to, in order to create this housing, and and, and that's that's the world I live in. And it's it takes a long time. If anything, we should have legislation to streamline that. But anyway, that's that's just my two cents. No, that's a good right. point, think... Paul. And actually, if if there was anything that could speed that process up, if there's funding, there's things there that should be done. Mm -hmm. Bill, I see you got I... your hand up. Uh, your microphone is off, Bill. Bill, or we can't hear you. We okay now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I had two different ways to mute. Um, last year there was a bill for tax credits for commercial conversion, and um, I thought it was going to be reintroduced this year, but I don't see it. Yeah, I I haven't seen it yet either. I thought that was a good bill, and yeah. that uh, and it gave um this was uh, state tax credits. Uh, yes, uh, it's a Debbie. Uh, it would address Debbie's issue. Um, if, uh, to, for uh, for landlords who converted office, um, uh, office space into affordable units, so yeah, you're right. That hasn't come back. Yeah, okay. that sounds like a good bill. I would I would support that. And there's a lot of large empty malls out there that uh, could either be office, mixed use, uh, temporary shelter. So. No, that's putting them in a waste. I, I will um, also say that um, you know, uh, you know, decades ago, um, some of the, the some of the cheapest housing that we had was actually boarding houses. And in most places, boarding houses aren't uh, are not allowed in zoning. Um, uh, I was thinking that as an approach uh, for this uh, this temporary pod um, bill is that you could uh, you know you could have a uh, a nonprofit or a church run a boarding house that provides services uh, and mm -hmm. help almost uh, provide a roof over the head of uh, people who are homeless, but also able to provide you know some supportive services to them as well. Um, but in most places, a boarding house wouldn't uh, be allowed. But mm -hmm. but at pre I, I mean, right now they do have halfway houses. That's true. It's just, it's just kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's a halfway house. It's a boarding house. It, boarding. And, and again, or YMCA's. You, it, 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 it's basically to be run in a real fashion, in, in a good fashion. Yeah. And, you know, of course, people aren't always running things well. Yeah, the YMCA used to be one of those institutions. Yeah. Boarding. All right. So let's. Uh, Let's wrap this up a little bit. Um, Sam, uh, what is your plan? You're going to send this list out to everyone, I hope. Uh, so if you take a look in the chat, you'll see a link that Kevin put there. This is the link to that spreadsheet. I'm going to also ha ask Eliza to email it to the RPC. Um, right. You um, as uh, and then uh, and then you can check back at this and see bills. If there's a bill that you are aware of that you think everyone else needs to be aware of, that needs to be added that you think Rivercock should should comment on, um, please email me. Um, and uh, and also as um, as the testimony that we submit gets posted to the CGA website, we'll add a link to the testimony. Um, and Frank, like um, I could quickly show people how to uh, how to access the CGA website if 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 people are interested. I don't know. I, I don't yeah, know. yeah, if it's quick, go ahead, Sam. I'll quickly. Doesn't I'll, hurt. I think quickly. most of them know, but but it doesn't hurt to take a look at it quickly. Yeah. Let's see. So the website Sam is going to is www.cga.ct.gov. A lot of dots there. And when you go in there, there'll be a municipal calendar that'll show you like what's going mm -hmm. on for the week. When and, you click on that, you'll be able to see like if there's a public hearing coming up and so forth. So usually what I do is there's like certain committees I watch. So I'll usually, so but there's many different ways of doing this and there's no correct way, but let's let, let's go to committees and we'll go planning and development. And... Are you able to see Sam's screen, everyone? Yeah. Uh -huh. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. So here we are, the planning development committee. 
Um, you can click in here and see the membership. So you have, you know, who the co-chairs are for your letter. Um, and let's say you want to, uh, let's say there's a bill that I just talked about that's on that list that you want to submit tem testimony. You write up your letter. Um, you have to save it either as a Word document or a PDF on your computer, or you can type it directly into the website. And I'll mm -hmm. show you. So, um, well, first of all, for, uh, so over here for the record, you have the bill record book that will list all the bills uh, before the committee um, uh, for planning and development. So uh, you can see everything in here on the left will be the bill number and a link to the bill page. It will also show the introducers. Uh, for a lot of them, there there really aren't. Uh, they're not they're not listed, but in some cases there are. Let's see, let's see if that. A lot uh, of these are committee bills, Sam. Yeah, they're committee bills. So, yeah. So here, actually, introducers has represent uh, represent Michelle. This is for the temporary shelter units. Represent Senator Anwar. Uh, mm, thank so, you. You're welcome. And then and then so so this shows all the bills. And then, and then the governor's bill is the bottom. And then, if you want to submit, you you find the committee that's holding the hearing for the bill that you're that you're interested in, and you click, you go to that committee page, and you, you click on submit public hearing testimony, and then ask you for your name. Hold. And you can put in if you're a, a planning and zoning member, regional planning committee member, whatever organization, River Cog, and then you pick the hearing date. So they show the hearing dates. Um, so last week was the first one for planning development. There's one on Wednesday and then there's one scheduled for the week after. So here, so if you go to, let's say the 28th, which is Wednesday, it will show you all the bills that are being heard on Wednesday. So here's the municipal internet websites, click on that. And then you can do supports or opposes. So let's say we support. And then you can either upload your file or you can type in my testimony. So if you don't want to, you can just type in your testimony and you can say, I think posting to town websites is great. <laughs> I am not going to submit this, um, but, 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 you, but that's an example of what you do. Click I'm not a robot and then submit testimony. It's as easy as that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so, so you you can you can write up a formal business letter uh, style document, or you can just type it right in there, and uh, and that's how you submit. Um, um, Thank you, Sam. And then and then you know there's also a link here on the bottom how to testify. You can testify. Um, uh, back when in in person test, uh, testifying was the only option, it was a great waste of a day. It can still sort of be a waste of the day sitting by your computer to do it by Zoom, but um, but at least you can do other things uh, until they call you. So um, and so this gives uh, you know how to uh, do um, how to how to um, how to register for uh, to give testimony if you very feel strongly. You would call the uh, the uh, you call the committee and and uh, and then you get called upon. So and you find out and then they have a drawing to pick what number speaker you are. So yeah, so those, that's how you can uh, be heard in Hartford. Thank you very much, Sam. Appreciate the. Uh, uh, go ahead, Raul. Yeah. Do, do you have you seen what they what the legislators get at the other end? Have you seen whether what the format? I mean, that might help to write the letters. I mean. Oh yeah. Uh, so they they get exactly what you said. So I'll show you. So let's yeah. go back. We're gonna go to uh, we're gonna go to the planning and development committee. Hmm. Go planning development committee. We are going to go to um, uh, public testimony. Hearing, uh, mm -hmm. Public hearing testimony. We'll click on that, and then here testimony by hearing dates. So you can do either by hearing date or that by bill. So let's let's find fifty one seventy four, which is all, right. well, all the way on the right there. Yep. Yep. And then here's here's uh, yeah, and then the, I'm pretty sure this is what they see. So they see all this here. So let's oh here's my testimony. We'll click on this. Yep, there you go. <laughs> yep. I submitted it. I submitted this this afternoon, and it opens up, and here it is. Oh, so you you type this. You you did this yourself by by uh, drafting it and then clip uh, post. I mean, um, pasting it in, right? Uh, so oh. no, no, I didn't paste it in. Um, I typed it in our on our letterhead uh, using Word, 
and then saved it as a PDF. And then I uploaded the document. So you right. can, so, so, so I saved the document on my computer. And then when it gives you the option to upload your document, your testimony, I uploaded it. And so you typed in all these names, for example. Well, uh, well for this, uh, this was just, I, I yes, I, I typed the letter myself. This is, um, but yes, I made sure it was the right co-chairs for the planning development committee um, and the right address. But you don't need all the names, Ro. If you just have planning and development committee, that's good enough. Yeah, you don't I mean, it could be as simple as not putting any of this on. If you type it into the text box. Does it, you, does it list it as a list of bill, for example? It does. I mean, you yeah, have, when you go, yeah. <clears throat> So I yeah so I, I I formatted this as a as a as a standard business letter with addressing it to the co-chairs and then I also recognized the ranking members and the committee members and and then and then the way I addressed this bill was I just it was a list of comments and questions um, and then and and then had my digital signature added that in and then submitted it so so it's on our letterhead and it looks professional but if you go to let's say my testimony I submitted to, let's see, um, testimony. So by hearing date. So um, um, so here is my testimony that I submitted on behalf of my condo association regarding the solar bill. Um, I, I use the same business structure as a, as a, a formal letter, um, but of course didn't put it on, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have letterhead for the condo association. Um, but, but, you know, I, you know, you, you can write as just a private citizen. Uh, I wrote as a board member of my condo, uh, talking about solar. So, so, um, yeah, but this is what, this is what they actually see. Yeah. And actually, even though they can look at it, um, electronically, of course, just, you know, like you're seeing here, uh, when I've been up to Harford, uh, they actually used to print them off and put them in a book when they have the hearing. So that mm -hmm. as they're sitting there listening to you, they're flipping the pages and you can actually say to them, you'll see people do it in a testimony. You have my, my written testimony and now I'm going to speak on blah, blah, blah. And then they'll flip to the, through the book and they actually have a copy of like, for instance, what Sam said. In. Thank you very so much Sam, for, on that for doing church that. on the religious property and the and the pods. Did they put you in the support category or the non-support category? I I I put opposed. Okay. Or, or I either put opposed or I put com uh, or, or or I put comments and questions. Like there is oh, a okay. there is a neutral category because I'm I'm like um let, let's see where I, where I fell like um it gives you three options we submit testimony and I and I don't know if I put oppose so supports, opposes, or general comments, and so okay. and so I either put opposed or general comments. I don't. I'm not necessarily opposed to uh, uh, some sort of manufactured pods for homeless people to get them out of tents. It's just the concept that there. I I, I saw some. I had some issues there, but right. um, I might have put general comments. Um, but okay. yeah, I saw your number two question was about density. Oh yeah, well, well, the, the, well. I, well I, my my question was um, was they typically, Base. yeah, typically for land uses, you, uh, you have a minimum parcel size, and so right. what is the min, minimum the percentage size? of coverage, uh, or, or minimum parcel size per unit, like um, mm -hmm. so you have one one pod, how much space do you need? Right, it? so it's really just a right. base. How much size? What is the idea? What is the best practice of how much space you should have per per pod? Right. And and if there is a measure for that, that should be in that should be in the statute. Yeah, as we do with camping, you know, yeah. there. We 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 really what this is is that it would be allowing a religious organization to build a campground. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for showing that, Sam. Um, and if you have questions on how to use this, you could certainly uh, just shoot Sam a quick quick uh, email if uh, you have any difficulty or what have you. It's really pretty straightforward. They've designed the interface to be uh, easy for the public to use. So let's move on to uh, item number nine, miscellaneous state, regional, and local planning issues. Um, I'll start this off briefly just by letting you know that the town of Durham has uh, is in the process of revising its residential zoning map and regulations. Uh, this is a kind of a 
tough thing to do. We were one acre zoning. We went to two acre zoning. We're now going kind of back to one acre, but there's one acre with stipulations and then acre and a half and then two. But uh, of course, you know, the, the, the public is out and uh, running around and some people have misinformation and some people uh, actually uh, have gone to the public hearing and commented. Uh, we're doing this to kind of approve the improve the affordability of building in Durham, along with the fact that our regulations haven't been updated for residential in a long, long time. So uh, that's what we've got going on. Is there anyone else that would like to communicate what's going on in their towns? Yeah, I just, um, Sam mentioned uh, a, a proposal for the, what's the Westbrook outlets, which are probably half empty. Um, and it's a, it's a, it, it's, it's fronted by, well, it, the, the, the applicant is the people that own LAZ parking out of Hartford and it's owned by a French REIT, which has billions. And, um, the proposals for like, uh, the specific one that, that I saw was like 450 apartments, um, a street with, uh, uh, street level, um, commercial um uh it they would um work with deep and have a um sewage treatment plant and then and then um you know pump it back into so it would be be treated not to, not um septic um and a um potential uh exit uh to the to the east in old saybrook on route 166 if they can get uh, DOT to allow it um, and it's really just been presented as a this at, at as a concept plan at this point mm -hmm. and the town is uh, asking the um, representatives to have a like a, a wide open meeting that's not a, a zoning or planning meeting just an informational meeting where people can express their opinions and um listen to each other so it's uh they have the money <laughs> as far as doing it and um that but but it's um th there's there's a lot of obstacles have, have they had the hearings uh for uh people to weigh in yet no zero no they they just presented it to the zoning commission as a um hey we're we're thinking about this um it's a it's a concept plan today and um, the the zoning first selectmen asked them to try and um, organize a, just a, a, a wide open informational meeting, not a hearing. A uh, question is: Is this they're building alongside the mall, or are they raising the mall? No, they flatten the mall. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, it's, so you know, one thing to think about it's it's between the railroad and the highway. It's already mm -hmm. all it's already all impervious. There's all the lights and turning lanes at exit sixty five. Right. Um and and you know, if if they do uh sewage treatment, it's non nitrogen going into the water. So there's and and as of now it's mostly a private road. Mm -hmm. So um it, it, yeah, I think there's going to be there's going to be much more tax revenue than expense. Um, all things that you have to think about. People are concerned about the school, but the school was built to, or the school system was built to house around 1,100 kids. It's got 700 today. So, and, and also there there is the clinic there down that yeah, road. It's beyond the clinic. Yeah, yeah, yeah I understand clinic will that. Stay. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's already, so it's, I mean, it definitely sounds like a TOD project for sure, huh? Yeah. It's, um, I might be a mile from the far end to the train station. Um, the bus does go in there. Mm. So it's, um, you know, one of the objections is, uh, I won't have room for my towel at the beach. Um, 
<laughs> you know, you know, it's the usual town. Uh, you know, we're a small town. We're gonna it it it, it could be at we're the population is sixty five hundred. It it this could house fifteen hundred. Yeah. Big job. Wow. But I think you know if if but one of my thoughts though is that if there's um international REITs with that much money and that much knowledge and that much market research are willing to spend a half a billion bucks. It, it certainly says somebody thinks there's um, profit to be made in it, sure. which um, just, just interesting. I'm, I'm still learning. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Bill. That's a really interesting project. So we'll, uh, try to follow that and maybe come back and once they do their presentation, let us know how that goes. So Carly, I, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Hey, thanks. So um, I actually, Frank, wanted to let you know or ask if I could connect with you about the revising your zoning maps and regulations because Chester is actually um, looking to do the same thing and we've tried to earmark some funds in the upcoming budget to to do this and we really weren't exactly sure how to approach it so could i connect with you offline about it absolutely absolutely awesome you want, thank you, you can hook up with me via email or however it works for you uh rivercock has of course rivercock puts our emails out anyway so you can certainly okay. uh, yeah do that look forward to thank it thank you all right any others Okay. If not, then a motion to adjourn would be in order. Bill, Bill you making that motion? <laughs> okay, Bill's made the motion. Second. Seconded, second by Alec. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstaining? I declare aye. the motion passed, and thank you, everyone. We look forward to seeing you next month, and Stay tuned to the bills that are up there because it's a short session. Thank right. you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.